Hello, my name is James Payne, and I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at the MIT Sloan School of Management in the System Dynamics Group. And today I'm here to share with you my research on algorithmic interventions and multi echelon supply chains. I'm specifically going to focus on model based versus model free approaches. Now, when I talk about a multi echelon supply chain, I'm referring to a system in which some sort of customer uh, gives an order signal to a retailer. But of course, that retailer may in turn send an order signal to their own suppliers who in turn have their own suppliers. And each of these entities in turn uh, supplies some sort of shipment based upon uh, the orders they received. And when I talk about a multi echelon supply chain, I also talk about bullwhip. Now, bullwhip refers to this phenomenon in which some sort of upstream perturbation in customer order signal uh, results in increasing amplification and also shifts in time, specifically something referred to as phase shifts, as you move further and further away from that original perturbation in order signal. Now, one thing I find interesting about bullwhip is that we're still talking about it. It's persistent. And a good body of research implies highly behavioral. Uh, Sturman's 1989 paper introduces concepts around supply chain underweighting. More recent papers from 2015 uh, examine individuals in the space in the context, context of cognitive reflection as a model for how individuals uh, make orders in multi echelon supply chains. Now, there's also been model free approaches. Uh, reinforcement learning approaches from 2008 and uh, decision support systems. Uh, more recently, in, in SOM in 2021, a modified DQN network uh, was used in this space. Now, this existence of model-based versus model-free approaches uh, imply that there's a gap here to possibly be explored. Opportunity to compare and contrast these model-based and model-free approaches uh, to bullwhip mitigation. And additionally, uh, directly examine the resulting ordering schemes in the context of uh, existing behavioral literature in order to possibly apply it more widely in the context of best practices. Now, uh, as sort of a model for this, I choose the beer game. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the beer game, it's a classical inventory management uh, simulation and learning tool. It has over 50 years of experience uh, at my current institution, MIT. And specifically in these sort of context of these very large games that we run for incoming, the incoming MBA class. Uh, now, the last 18 months haven't slowed us down. While we can't do a lot of this in person, we've moved online. Uh, now this online environment still elicits from players uh, this, these classic sort of bullwhip outcomes. Specifically, you can see right there at the amplification and phase shift uh, from that initial order signal. So ultimately, what this project sort of endeavors to do is uh, to build um, an environment in which uh, models of real human players uh, making uh, human-like order decisions uh, exist and interact with each other. And then we can take one of those uh, uh, entities replace it with a, some sort of algorithmic intervention, either uh, based upon uh, the, the behavioral model scheme used for the other players or perhaps a model-free uh, uh, approach. So talking about uh, the behavioral ordering model approach, uh, this is based around Sturman's 19, uh, 1989 configuration uh, that uses four sort of key parameters within the space uh, for uh, entities to take in information and change their expectations uh, for the future. So specifically, there's some sort of exogenous order signal uh, that feeds into the retailer's uh, uh, sort of expectation for the future uh, that then affects their own orders uh, downstream to a wholesaler that then affects their order to a downstream distributor, which then affects their order to a factory. That factory in turn makes some sort of uh, production uh, uh, decision that then is used to fill uh, upstream sit shipment requests in sequence. So uh, this sort of baseline model is able to reproduce uh, 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 bullwhip as seen in sort of classical uh, uh, papers like Sermon's 1989 paper, and also produce sort of an aggregate model of uh, humans making uh, orders within the space. This thing in turn gives us an opportunity uh, then to do an optimization against the sort of model of human-based ordering, specifically fixing some one entity in this team, allowing the other three to continue to, to act based around uh, those existing models of how real people made orders within this space, uh, but then vary those four parameters, the theta, the alpha, the S prime, and the beta, in order to minimize the overarching team cost. Essentially, um, to say what sort of, uh, sort of model of a person existing within the space would have reduced the most, would have reduced cost the most. Sort of as one example of this, this is one optimization that was performed at one position, the distributor, uh, and this showed about a 48% reduction in costs within this space. I would say that this is repeated across all positions within the supply chain, also possibly with multiple different sort of concepts of what a baseline is, uh, given uh, sort of uh, models of, of real teams. 
Now, one thing amongst all these different optimizations, there are certain commonalities that, uh, that emerge. Specifically, uh, this idea of theta being very low for the retailer who's facing the customer order, but very high for all other members of the supply chain. In my mind, theta is directly analogous to trust. So theta is uh, the parameter in the space by which uh, a player takes in an order signal and then updates their future expectation for what future orders will be. So the retailer is actually very slow uh, to take the customer customer's current order as indicative of, of what their future order will be. Uh, but every other entity within the supply chain very quickly updates their future expectations, again, for the optimized entities, uh, based upon the signal they're receiving by the, from their fellow members of the supply chain. Uh, beta lands uh, very high at or near one, uh, which directly maps to these concepts around uh, sort of avoiding supply chain underweighting. You remember the signals you've given uh, to, uh, to your supply chain partners, and you expect them to be realized at some point in the future. And then finally, uh, this concept of S prime, which is the desired stock, uh, ends up falling really close um, to the classic sort of solution to bullwhip under stationary, um, stationary uh, uh, demand and also completely rational players of this base stock replenishment number. So then this then raises the question, great, uh, but is this more generally applicable? And also was really this model-based approach even necessary to begin with? And we start asking questions like that, you really start probing at this boundary that exists between model-based approaches and model-free approaches uh, within um, sort of supply chain management. And then also you start asking questions about whether or not that boundary is even necessary uh, or, or even exists. So when I talk about model-free approaches, uh, we can talk about sort of the current state. Uh, I really encourage anyone to read this 2021 paper in Insom, in which they do a, sort of a modified uh, DQN network, uh, specifically modify it in terms to allow the, the players to uh, get a concept of, of cost as you go along the game. Um, additionally, that's actually really important because for these multi-echelon supply chains, especially the bullwhip, the full state of information is unknown to any one entity. So it's a little bit difficult to come up with an idea of what cost really is, especially since it's not really uh, sort of fully realized until the very end of the game. And additionally, uh, in my view, the current state matters almost as much, if not more, than any one action you may take in that place. Sort of the relative value of a specific action is, is highly modified uh, by the idea of, of are you currently in um, sort of the, the peak of that bullwhip, or are you in an inventory management crisis that's, a, that's in the process of unfolding or is, is in the process of sort of calming down? And the moment you start talking about this idea of that the state and the action uh, might have two different sort of relative values in a given point in time, you can then start talking about a dual approach where you separate out uh, the Q value for the state versus the, for the action. Uh, also, there is a, a small issue with sort of unlimited uh, order space within this. So another approach, which is actually used in the 2021 MSOM paper, is to do a sort of order plus idea, that your order is relative to the last order you received. So the actual DQN that I built here, it's based upon a sort of a flexible gym environment in which I could then uh, build out um, sort of random assemblages of teams uh, over like you know, random time horizons, uh, additionally over possibly noisy realizations of order decisions. Um, and then the actual structure of the of the DQ in itself, as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a dual system um, and specifically uses a state that is a combination of just the information that any one entity within the beer game actually has access to, but specifically repeated over um, a history of, of four previous sort of observations, which maps with sort of the, the amount of time that a signal that's sent by an entity within the space uh, is, is transmitted upstream and then comes back around again. So in terms of actual results, this is one result of sort of at the wholesaler position. In this specific case, uh, costs were reduced by about 69%. So this uh, DQN, this dual DQN is learning something. It, it, is, it is learning a mechanism by which it can reduce costs within this space. Um, and then noticing that both the model-based and the model-free approaches are able to reduce costs, it then begs the question of sort of, okay, now what's, what really, how strong is that boundary between these two approaches? Uh, so one way to do that is to probe it by taking both of these uh, algorithmic approaches and putting them in increasingly hostile and non-ideal environments uh, that, that differ from their original sort of training set. The specific mechanism in this case uh, was adding noise um, around the, uh, the, the final order uh, that came out of the ordering decisions of the models of the real human players it was playing against, uh, which in turn were random assemblages of models of prior teams. 
So this right here is showing sort of the relative advantage of the um, model free approach, the dual DQN versus the model based approach. So I'm first going to draw your attention to the two extreme ends of, of this supply chain, the retailer and the factory. In this case, uh, the model based approach consistently did better. But now, however, when we look at the middle of the supply chain, notably the wholesaler and distributor, especially as you get to increasingly sort of noisy uh, environments, uh, the value of this model free approach uh, starts to increase. And um, actually more looking at more specifically in general for, for uh, almost every position with the notable exception of the retailer, the value of the model free approach, the dual DQN increases as you start getting into a more uh, noisy, less ideal environment. Uh, drawing this back to sort of some of the more recent real world examples uh, from our uh, series of games that we played in August of 2021, those two middle positions, the wholesaler and distributor, account for a slight majority of the overarching costs on average incurred by a team, about 55% of the overarching costs. So uh, bringing this all together, what does this all mean? Uh, what it means to me, at least, is that this idea of there being sort of this boundary between model-based and model-free approaches is a bit of a, a bit of a, a false dichotomy that we build. Really, these approaches complement and build on each other. This model, uh, the model-free DQN approach, also becomes increasingly more valuable under more noisy circumstances, as you break away essentially from from the assumptions that your behavioral model was built was built on. And specifically also works a little bit better in these more decoupled positions, what I refer to as decoupled positions, the, of the wholesaler and distributor. The retailer, the factory uh, are the ones who have the most control over their environment. The retailer has uh, visibility to the true customer order signal, and the factory is producing its own production signal at the end of the day. Whereas sort of these two middle positions, the wholesaler and distributor, are, are um, have less control over their own environment. And again, these positions where the model free approach is uh, most valuable, and this analysis uh, corresponds to about 55% of the total costs in real world, recent world world games. Another observation from all this is that the uh, model based approach is surprisingly robust. Uh, while I said that as the, um, the model free approach becomes more valuable, as, as your environment gets more noisy, the model based approach, even under sort of uh, uh, highly noisy environments, generally is still uh, uh, cost reducing uh, for almost every position. Uh, with the exception of the wholesaler in this specific uh, simulation. In my mind, this leads a lot of validity to some of the general behavioral observations that have come out of prior literature, specifically this idea of avoiding supply chain underrating and internal trust in a supply chain is valuable in general. So further discussion, um, this introduced a, an optimized agent from both a model-free and a model-based approach that reduced uh, costs associated with bullwhip, but in both cases did so in a me method that uh, didn't impose any additional constraints on the behavioral ordering of the other human partners within this system. Uh, for me, that's important. This lets people be people at the end of the day. Uh, this is an empirically grounded simulation because it uses models of real human ordering decision based upon real runs of this game, but not empir empirically ve uh, verified, at least as of yet. Um, additionally, something I should point out, especially for the uh, model-based approach, this depended on a stationary order signal. There was a step input, uh, but that step input was still stationary, and that kind of reflected in what the outcome of that S prime number was. Uh, an opportunity for the future is to expose this to a non-stationary order signal and um, kind of dive in a little bit more about the relative advantages of both a model-based and model-free approach. So wrapping it all up, uh, this project presents both a model-based and model-free approach uh, to algorithmic interventions uh, within the context of a multi-echelon supply chain, specifically with the aim of mitigating bullwhip. Uh, the model-based intervention was specifically uh, sort of analyzed in the context of existing uh, best practices in, in supply chain literature, uh, while the model-free approach uh, utilizes this concept of a dual DQN structure in a novel setting, uh, and both uh, reduce cost uh, within this multi-echelon supply chain, uh, but do so without relying on changing the behavioral features of their supply chain partners. Uh, some next steps here are uh, sort of an empirical verification. Uh, I would like to really take some of these methods and put them in the context of those large real world games that we saw at the beginning of this presentation. Additionally, this then raises some questions about how sort of real humans when exposed uh, to these algorithms uh, may modify their own behaviors. So with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, I look forward to your, your questions. And I also really look forward to seeing all of you again in person as soon as possible. Thank you very much.